This is David Sellers. This is part two of a video presentation I did at the Emerging Technology Summit that was too big to fit in YouTube as one part, so I broke it up into three parts. The life cycle cost of a filter, if you look at it, there's more to it. If you look at the cost per day versus time, there's a first cost component that decreases over time, and it's very nonlinear. Like, say you spend $1,000 for a set of filters for an air handling unit. Well, the first day you run those filters, it costs you $1,000 a day. Second day you run them, it costs you $500. The fourth day, it costs you $250. So you have this exponential decay in cost over time. Meanwhile, the energy cost tends to increase with time. As the filter loads up, the pressure drop increases, and until you hit a point with most filters where it starts to break down, it starts to skyrocket. Um, and the energy costs go up because the static pressure goes up, because back to that fan power equation I showed you earlier. And if you add those two curves up, you end up with a curve that has an inflection point, and it's at that inflection point when your best life cycle cost is achieved. So it's a function of the first cost and a function of the energy cost, the pressure drop. And so that's that's really the way to go about changing your filters, monitor those things. And um, there's some advantages when you look at it that way to the more expensive filter media. You notice there's a big price variation between those filter types and that I was, that I have as samples. Um, the more expensive media tends to give you more surface area. It tends to give you engineered loading characteristics where as the filter loads, the pressure drop versus flow characteristic tends to stay very flat. Um, the pressure drop versus flow, the low pressure drop turns into fan energy, and the increased surface area, that's just, it can hold more dust. It just can. It can hold more dust. And that's essentially what you're trying to do is capture and retain dust. So if the filter has more surface area to do that, that's a good thing. It costs you more money, but if you look at it in a life cycle cost standpoint, there can be advantages to that. There's lower fan energy, there's longer life, so you save on first costs. Ultimately, even though the filter is more expensive, you buy fewer of them. You may even be able to eliminate pre-filters, which is a huge benefit, actually. Pre-filters, you got to remember, pre-filters don't make the air leaving the final filters any cleaner. They just protect the final filters and keep them from bloating as quickly. But if the final filters can hold two or three or four times as much dust as the ones you were using, maybe you get rid of the pre-filters and just let them load a little faster because you can actually run. If you get rid of the pre-filters, you got rid of a fixed pressure drop in the system forever and assume the final filters are rated for it. And most of them, that's part of what you get for what the money you spend. Most of them can take more static, you can actually run that final filter to the pressure drop that you used to run the pre-filter plus final filter to. So it tends to make the life cycle longer. So you can leverage those things and actually gain some benefits. And uh, like I've actually built spreadsheets to model this where we use the loading rates. We actually model loading rates based on field data we've collected from a number of sites. And for instance, this is a project in Berkeley where uh, that's a plot of their, how they're running, how they were initially running. They were basically running bag filters with pre-filters and they would you know, change them every two years. And that's where the little bump in the curve is. Um, we proposed eliminating the pre-filters and using a more expensive final filter that had much lower clean pressure drops um, and, and uh, a flatter loading characteristic. And that's what its modeled characteristic looks like based on, again, field data for a similar filter. And you can see it could last three or four years. There's actually an inflection point there somewhere around 36 months, but it's pretty flat. And so the accumulated savings over time, you know, starts getting pretty significant there on the left axis. You you lose, you know, early on, but you start making money after that. And this the curves diverge. I mean, as long as you do this, more money you save. And it's very low risk. It doesn't take different frames or anything. In fact, the utility program's worried about giving us a credit for the energy savings because of the persistence angle. Their perspective being, well, what if somebody puts the old fitters back in and we lose our savings. And that's a, that's a valid point. We have some ways to deal with that, but that's a valid point. Here's a, basically the numbers on that, on that chart. And one of the points is it's really important to take a life cycle perspective. Um, they were running filters two years anyway. And so looking at one year, which programs tend to do, it, it, it doesn't, it saves energy, but it, there's a net cost 
you know, loss. But at the end of the four years, there's a significant benefit both in both in uh, first, uh, both in energy, even though there is a slight penalty still in first cost for the filters. But the real the real advantage, or another advantage that I think is really significant that we don't pay attention to, is you know how much waste we're throwing in the landfill, and that's not only space in landfill, that's transportation to the landfill, that's you know renting dumpsters to hold the stuff to take it to the landfill. There's a lot of stuff wrapped up in that number. Um, and this is one 32,000 CFM arrow handling system. And if you figure, you know, nominally a building is a CFM a square foot and think about the square footage of buildings out there, this could be really significant. This is like a big deal, I think. So um, the other point I wanted to make with this table is the cost and benefit may not occur in the same purchasing group. That's been a problem several places. In other words, the people that buy the filters have a different budget than people that pay the energy. And so the people that buy the filters don't see the benefit of the energy savings. And so unless you get these departments talking to each other, there's this like, well, I'm not going to buy the more expensive filters. Why should I spend more money thus to save those guys some money? I mean, you got to get people to say it's not those guys. This is sort of like a Zen thing. This is, this is all, we're all united in this whole thing. And we really are, I personally think. Um, but you know, you got to get people working together. You got to integrate the people. It's more than just integrating the systems, which is kind of the commissioning thing. Um, what's really cool about current technology, and this is from that same Berkeley job, we actually realized, well, gosh, you know, if we had a little table where in the control system where the guys could enter, here's what we spent on filters, here's what it cost us to install them, and then tracked filter pressure drop and flow, we could actually draw that that filter operating cost curve real time and which is what this what this graphic is this is we're just getting this run and we were just troubleshooting it gary was looking at it a couple weeks ago and we found a few bugs but we're fixed like a calibration of the flow sensors and stuff but basically when we get this working it'll draw that average daily filter operating cost curve and this will be what they use to change the filters the trend off of this data they'll watch for that inflection point when they see the curve bottom out and start back up they'll order a new filter set because that's their best life cycle cost so that's leverage and technology to sort of help support what we're doing. Now, something that came up that I would have never thought of had I not worked in process, I wanted to do this on the filters in Komatsu, and I sort of was getting a little groundswell of support, but the big challenge turned out to be the, the filter types, specific filter types, and the change-out interval based on time was built into our QC standards for our wafers. So until we changed QC standard to reflect what we wanted to do, which involved convincing them that it really wouldn't affect product quality in addition to convincing them to take the time to do all that, we couldn't do it because if we had done it and then we'd been audited by one of our, our, our uh, the people we sold wafers to and they found that we weren't complying with our QC standards, they would have rejected our wafers. That didn't matter if the product quality was good on all the other fronts, we violated our QC standards. So that's something to think about. If you try to do this, there may be some ripple effects that you need to think about up front before you just carte blanche do it. Not Probably not a problem in an office building, but it could be in healthcare and certainly in process, something you got to think about. Um, Another thing to think about when you're doing design is where the filter is can really impact the fan energy because you can create bad discharge conditions. Like the most codes would have you stick the final filters downstream of the fan, which puts you in a sort of a really bad fan discharge configuration or forces you to a plenum fan, which most times I've looked at it basically is a 6 to 8% efficiency sacrifice over a, a housed fan, assuming you can have a good fan discharge. If you can get the filters ahead of the fan and then hook the duct up and get a good discharge condition, minimize the system effect, there's significant energy savings and performance associated with that. And we actually, in a Midwest venue, um, were able to get the authority having jurisdiction and the hospital licensing end of things to agree to the pre-filters ahead of the fan because... They were also interested in energy because we were buying high-quality fan systems and included a test for leakage on the fan casing and because the systems ultimately were serving a surgery which had a final set of HEPA filters right at the ceiling. So if we did have a little leakage downstream of the final filters, we still had a mechanism to deal with that. So another, you know, think outside the box a little bit. Just because the code says we don't want you to do this doesn't mean you can't have a discussion about it, and occasionally you can win. Um, to everybody's benefit. So details, you know, talking about details, but here's another detail that matters. This is actually one of those, um, one of the uh, 
the rigid pocket filters that I showed earlier on, and we had installed it in a facility with the hope of reducing the energy and the pressure drop uh, compared to the bag filters they had. And, and we did, but we were at like 0.19, and what we realized was that these bags, even though they were sort of rigid, they'd sort of deform a little bit and weren't perfectly open as the airflow changed when the fan started and stopped. And then it turned out that there were these spacers that was an option for the filters, but basically it cost about five bucks a filter for two spacers that sort of kept the bags, you know, shaped exactly right, not and they didn't deform and flex. They weren't drooping or anything like that, but they just sort of collapsed in a little bit in some places. And so we took this as an opportunity to run a test. One of our guys has a real strong NEB background. He actually taught NEB balancers when he um, was in his former life. And so we basically held the flow as constant as we could as we installed these spacers. And the bottom line is after we installed the spacers, we were running about the same flow rate at eight hundredths of an inch less static pressure. And that doesn't sound like much, but every little bit helps. You know, we spent 220 bucks for the spacers. We saved eight hundredths of an inch on a system that ran 24-7 with 10 cent electricity moving 67,000 CF. And it was like 800 bucks a year. You know, that's, you know, that sort of, you know, bought lunch, definitely paid for the spacers. So... You know, some, the details matter. You know, you really got to pay attention to the details. Um, one way to verify that the details are true is to have an independent lab ask for an independent lab test of the filters uh, you're considering to verify it really works the way the manufacturer says it does. Uh, this is an example. You can go online, actually, and if, if you Google for you know, independent laboratory testing of filters, you'll find organizations that do that, and most of them have sample reports, and this is just pages from a sample report. But they test for pressure drop, the particle filtration, they test for the MERV rating, they test for filter loading. Um, they can pretty much verify that the manufacturer's claims are valid. Um, 